Hi, I'm gonna present you work uh, in collaboration with a number of people from the Imageomics Institute, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you just in a little bit uh, what that institute is about and, and a few of the things that it does. Uh, so I, I think it's fairly well recognized here, so I don't have to spend a whole lot of time convincing you that uh, machine learning is widely used across the life sciences and has really brought about a fundamental insights and, and, and powers, uh, especially also in the realm of uh, foundation models that you know start to understand the language of biology, if you will, right? So as molecular language in terms, in terms of DNA, in terms of proteins, in terms of uh, uh, and structure and so on and so forth, right? But I wanna, really wanna talk more about here is that machine learning has also enabled biological discovery from uh, very uh, different types of unstructured data. And by what I mean by unstructured data is data that is very different from uh, you, you know, tables, uh, sequences, uh, things that you can easily index into and ask what it is. And so uh, this is, for example, bioacoustics, uh, images, uh, video clips, remote sensing, right? And, and there's an enormous amount of machine learning uh, advance or enabled advances uh, for biology and, and including especially ecology. And so uh, in this realm specifically, biological images uh, are a very vast trove of data, right? There's, there's uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of images collected by citizen science uh, initiatives such as iNaturalist. Uh, there's a, an almost equal number of images uh, digitized from uh, natural history collections uh, of, uh, of holding biological specimens. Uh, there's very specialized data sets now too that put um, uh, uh, biological uh, specimens in controlled conditions. Uh, there's more curated data sets, annotated data sets. It's, uh, it's, it's really a vast treasure trove. And so this is where the Imageomics Institute comes in. It's really, it's a very large uh, uh, and geographically very distributed collaboration funding funded by the National Science Foundation, devoted really uh, on, on sort of a broad level uh, of making biological traits computable from these unstructured uh, data, in particular images, video, 3D, and so on and so forth, right? So, so in essence, the idea here is based on a predecessor project using knowledge uh, that we already have in structured form and use that to guide the machine learning to come up with more sensical results and, and constrain the results in other ways, right? Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, skip over or, or briefly uh, a glance at a few vignettes to just give an, you know, an idea of what uh, the Institute does. Uh, there's uh, very many other pro uh, research projects going on, but just briefly, one here, for example, uh, uses uh, structured knowledge in the form of phylogenetic trees to constrain uh, the embedding space uh, learned uh, from images uh, such that it is predictive of, or representative of traits uh, in the images, and then you can sort of turn these on and off. In another one, um, uh, there's a team trying to uh, relate uh, the uh, patterns, the wing patterns uh, among a group of butterflies um, that hybridizes as well as mimics each other and relates so in sort of a GWAS sense to uh, positions on the chromosome. Uh, there's also a research group that developed a, a foundation model uh, for biodiversity at large, uh, allowing uh, classification of images across hundreds of, literally hundreds of thousands of classes, right? And structuring the embedding space in a way that suggests that it understands uh, the traits uh, uh, that separate biodiversity. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit more here now about the uh, specific application, right? So these workflows, maybe it, give, it gave you a little bit of a glimpse that these workflows are really, really complex. Uh, there's various steps in pre-processing of data and the kinds of algorithms that need to be applied uh, to uh, start to even, uh, before you can even start to extract knowledge from these data, right? Uh, so I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm gonna enumerate them all. Just suffice it to say, there's very many steps. Um, then also uh, uh, re workflows that are both fair and also reproducible uh, really matter, right? I, I, I think that's widely appreciated in the genomics community. 
Uh, but you know, there's a few things that um, come additionally into play uh, for machine learning that has its own uh, reproducibility crisis um, from things like you know, high parameters not being given, uh, data splits in, uh, not really being very clear, the exact methods uh, and techniques that we use in which order not being exactly clear, right? And there's also the special issues of data leakage in machine learning, right? And uh, you know, a reproducible workflow doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have any data leakage, right? Um, but at least uh, so long as we can make uh, the exact steps fully transparent and documented and inspectable, right? Maybe others can find where there is data leakage, you know, in, in sort of a community way, right? Uh, research teams in Emigenomics are also inherently very interdisciplinary, and this poses also a number of problems, right? Um, computer science, the machine, the AI, and machine learning research often moves at a, as, as I think we've all come to appreciate here, at an enormously rapid pace, right? Uh, and, and sort of the, the way to interact with these models that result out of the machine learning research, or, uh, research work uh, ch can change quite frequently, right? Uh, these different people don't necessarily, or the, these uh, the, uh, people with these different uh, sort of uh, backgrounds don't necessarily speak the same language, right? I, I think we kind of uh, intuitively understand quite a bit of this from genomics uh, teams, which also tend to often be uh, quite interdisciplinary. And so, uh, fortunately, uh, as I you know was alluding to a few times already. Uh, these, uh, many of these experiences in these issues have already been encountered over the years and really addressed in numerous ways in computational genomics. And so there's a lot of things we can actually draw from, uh, you know, from rules to technologies uh, uh, and, and so forth. There's many more, well, there's many more, right, uh, than, than, uh, than are on the slide. These are just uh, some of the ones that we particularly drew from, right? But, but uh, as I think many know here, so there's uh, a lot more. And so one of the key steps we took um, to enable really mostly communication uh, across the team where everybody uh, could start to get on the same page and understood what, he, uh, what everybody else meant was to differentiate between a conceptual workflow and an application specific workflow implementation, right? Where the conceptual workflow isn't, isn't, isn't executable. So maybe for those familiar with sort of UML, right? One way to maybe relate this to sort of a sequence diagram in a, in a UML modeling exercise, right? Which is by itself non-executable, but which brings every, which can bring everyone in the pay, uh, on the same page as to what step uh, uh, talks uh, to what other, uh, at which point, you know, through which, uh, with which data or which protocol, right? And so, you know, one of the key issues uh, or challenges that we ran into that different people across the team understood very different things about what a workflow actually is to begin with, right? And so it really helps, uh, it really helped a big, uh, a big amount with this. And so um, do you uh, give a concrete case study here uh, that, that we uh, uh, used uh, to develop a lot of the results is a, uh, it's a case study of extracting traits from fish specimen images. You see at the top, near the top left here how these images usually look, right? So there's a number of steps involved, uh, 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 identifying where the ruler is so that you can actually uh, know how many pixels correspond to a centimeter, uh, 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 identifying where the actual fish is in the image, uh, cropping it, right? Uh, segmenting it out and then possibly identifying uh, certain uh, what the segments are, right? And then there's a whole sort of uh, uh, domain specific uh, part that follows that, right? What, 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 what do you actually do? How do you quantify the different traits uh, that, that are sort of beyond uh, the actual computer science or machine learning part, right? That allows you then to uh, answer uh, uh, scientific questions. So, um, so this is uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a diagram, in a cartoon, the um, conceptual workflow, right? Where you have uh, sort of uh, in uh, four 
in, in what's enumerated there is four. You have sort of a core machine learning workflow that's preceded by a number of uh, more domain science or application specific steps, right? And there's also follow up by application specific steps or research question specific steps, I should say, right? So the conceptual workflow uh, really does a nice job of starting to break down what's actually sort of the uh, computer science machine learning reusable part uh, that um, uh, can equally apply to multiple uh, research questions or research uh, uh, you know, data, uh, filtering pre-processing me mechanisms and different research questions at the other end, right? Uh, and so um, we well, and that and and so this this picture here, you know, where we already have steps outlined and have uh, outlined how the data flows between these steps, right? This is then a part that uh, the research software engineers and the team can take to actually create uh, the application-specific implementation, right? Uh, where maybe not everyone still understands every single part. Um, but where we can all have confidence that it actually corresponds to what we all agreed upon uh, and understood as a team beforehand, right? So um, one, one thing that, uh, so again, you see right in the middle here, this reusable part uh, that's preceded by uh, research application specific uh, data acquisition, data filtering, uh, metadata, et cetera, parts. And that's at the end uh, followed by uh, you know, the uh, research question specific analytic parts, right? And so every single uh, every single step here, right, is codified as a rule in snake make that says which, in, uh, which input data, it turns into which output data, right? Uh, and uh, you know, every uh, software component is in a component, uh, is, in, is in a container, right? Um, uh, that's versioned, et cetera. Right. Uh, so, so these are all right. The fair principles applied to the components of the workflow. And so maybe just a few words in terms of lessons, uh, you know, takeaways. Uh, why did we actually why did we end up choosing SnakeMake? Um, so it really uh, had a number of advantages. You know, obviously, there's a number of uh, uh, workflow definition uh, systems and languages around, right? But SnakeMake had particularly advantages in terms of being uh, familiar, having familiar concepts to computer scientists from, you know, who work with make files. Uh, it's really based on Python. So, you know, everyone who works in machine learning, uh, it's immediately familiar, that part. Uh, and it's actually also uh, understandable by biologists who already dabbled in Python, right, due to scientific computing being, uh, a, a lot of which being, is being done in Python. So it really delivered and um, sort of empowering the um, biologist here, which uh, was one of our main goals. Uh, going from the original situation where essentially the biologist was completely disempowered and had to hand over their selection of data to the you know, computer scientist who would then sort of run everything by hand. Um, one other big point is that SnakeMate really also really promotes a modularization. It supports having workflows within workflows or workflows that themselves become components, right? And it's really uh, interoperable across uh, a whole slew of uh, different types of types of high performance computing systems. So um, in, 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 in summary, um, you know, uh, one thing we found is that producibility and end-to-end -end automation go hand in hand, right? So the more the aim for end-to-end -end automation, the more you promote reproducibility and the other way around. Uh, the technologies you choose can, can really matter and, and can really have an effect in terms of empowering or disempowering uh, different people on your team. Um, and uh, metadata are very important. I think that's uh, probably widely appreciated here, including uh, vocabularies, ontologies, and other standards uh, for achieving products, uh, you know, workflow components or workflows as a whole that are fair. And uh, noteworthy, you know, in contrast to data and software, right? So there, there, there's, there are checklist papers uh, uh, laying out what, what should kind of be the criteria for a data product to be fair. There is now, uh, that's obviously several years old, right? There are since two years, uh, and I think it was published in 2022, Barker et al. Uh, uh, that's also been laid out for uh, research software, right? 
but it's really only emerging for uh, models, for machine learning models, right? There, there are some groups that are working on that. And um, I just wanna say that machine learning workflows are kind of yet another step behind in terms of this kind of formalization of checklists, right? And so just looking beyond, um, you know, uh, what I didn't really talk about at all, but I think it's really important is that uh, to put more effort on workforce training, right? Uh, uh, on, on all the things uh, that, that kind of go into this in terms of skills, foundational skills, right? Starting from abortion control uh, to all kinds of other things, you know, what are actually workflow managers. Um, and uh, finally, you know, uh, not to forget, uh, there are efforts out there, including in the uh, biology slash ecology realm, which is the, uh, which is a research coordination network, right? As well as in the international realm, there is a uh, fair for machine learning effort now within the RDA of the Research Data Alliance. And um, just want to you know, call out these efforts because I find it important to coordinate. Um, and so, yeah, so acknowledgments, uh, right, just want to point out that um, this is just sort of the more technical part of this work. Uh, there's a lot more people that contributed to that from different teams at Drexel, Virginia Tech, Tulane, Neon. Uh, they're all co-authors on the paper, and uh, if you uh, want to know a little bit more, both in the backstory as well as the results, um, the various considerations and lessons we learned, there's a lot more detail in the paper that was published recently. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm struck by something. So there's been, I would say, decades of work on biologically specific workflow languages. You know, Taverna comes to mind, but there were a million of them. And they never really seem to get all that much uptake. And now I see a lot of stuff in the world that uses things like SnakeMake or maybe CWL or these much more generic workflow languages. Do you have any idea why the generic ones seem to have really gotten uptake while the biologically specific ones did not? Uh, well, in a way, it's kind of obvious, right? In in the sense that the generic ones just have so so workflows isn't uh, in reproducible workflows and workflows that are you know automated uh, uh, and and, uh, and fair, right? That's not a problem restricted to biology, right? Here we're already talking about the intersection of machine learning. Uh, and computer science, but if you just look at, for example, machine learning, right, part of the reproducibility crisis in machine learning, if you look into it, is clearly because uh, if, you, if, if you try to see in paper, right, what people did, uh, it's mostly descriptions and text what they did, right? There isn't that really ever a workflow, let alone one that's uh, reproducible, right? Uh, the same goes for physics, right? Um, we're working through a wider, through this uh, HDR or, or this NSF program called Harnessing the Data Evolution, uh, uh, HDR, right? We're working with uh, people working in physics and all other uh, and all kinds of other uh, disciplines, and they're and, and they're facing exactly the same problem, right? So the problem of workflows and making them reproducible uh, and automated, right, and well documented uh, in an executable form is pretty universal, and a language that can support that, uh, even if it's just more in perception than reality, I think matters, or, you know, just lends itself more. So, so that would be my answer, perhaps. Great talk, thank you. I was actually uh, surprised that you could get traits from images, so probably we should do that for microbes, I'll talk to you after. But one thing I wanted to ask you about is you mentioned the uh, data model and data sheets. As part of Bridge 2 i we actually developed schemas for data sheets for data sets and model cards. And I think this is the first time I've seen it mentioned in the talk. So do you want to maybe say a little more about that? Uh, about uh, data, data. Yeah, model and data cards. You had it at the bottom of. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's just one thing we uh, find particularly powerful uh, about uh, Hugging Face as a platform uh, that really implements uh, both model, you know, initially meta, uh, sort of the data repository as a type of repository, right, came later in Hugging Face. Uh, it really started as a model sharing platform, right? Um, but but there was, was, early on, there was a lot of talk about um, the potential uh, biases and limitations in machine learning models, right, and pre-trained models, right? 
and, and sort of as model cards that have uh, extensive and really rich metadata, uh, uh, you know, for describing uh, how they were trained, uh, how the data sets were procured, you know, through which what the hyperparameters were, et cetera, et cetera, proved uh, really valuable uh, to understand models in the first place, right? Understand what they're capable of, what they're probably not capable of, um, what their biases probably are, you know, what to be careful about. Uh, when you use them, and so and so that then got um, it, it, you know applied to data sets as well, and 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 uh, I, I I I guess especially in machine learning world, the, the data sets data sets can be quite messy, or at least their sources can. Number one and number two, the source documenting probably how you pulled your data set together, right? Uh, data sets in machine learning are often, very often, pulled together from numerous places, right? And it's a, it's a big issue and a big challenge to document that and attribute that properly, right? And data sets cards, I think, have been helping to uh, uh, encourage and promote that um, uh, to a significant degree. And that's certainly something we try to promote whenever, whenever we can and to the extent we can, too, because it's very important.